On today's World Insight, the real score on the national security legislation for the HK SAR from a former president of the HK Legislative Council, Rita Fan Sulai Tai. National security is for the whole country. Every inch of land of China must be covered by the same national security. The course on Hong Kong's Chinese heritage, the failures and fixes, in the words of longtime education advocate Annie Wu Suk Ching. If you don't take care of the young people of today, 20 years from now, they will say they are only Hong Kong people, they are not Chinese. And Macau's efforts to recover from COVID 19, from the Macau delegate to the NPC. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. As China wraps up its annual political season this week, the decision to introduce legislation related to national security issues of Hong Kong captures the headline. As NPC Standing Committee begins its work on the legislation, I talked to Rita Fan, former president of the Hong Kong Legislative Council. She knows more than anybody else about why such legislation is so crucial today for Hong Kong. Could you help me to understand your understanding of the latest decision made by the National People's Congress regarding the legislation of uh, national security issues related to Hong Kong? The purpose of this um, uh, national security law for Hong Kong is really to ensure, first of all, that the on-country system cannot be compromised by terrorist act, by mobsters, violent actions. And secondly, it also ensures that uh, the secession of the country and the subversion of the government cannot take place. Thirdly, it would not allow foreign power or bodies to interfere with Hong Kong's internal affairs. In other words, to, to instigate, to plan, to teach uh, the young people to do all kinds of illegal activities. And last but not least, to fight against terrorism. We needed that kind of protection. We need to know what is happening in Hong Kong and at least we can take some precaution so that it doesn't get out of hand. I, I'm afraid that at the present moment, things have got out of hand. A, a normal see. person like me, a retiree, when I want to go to a shopping mall during weekend, in the past I can go with whichever shopping mall I like. Now I dare not. I will try to find out from the new news which shopping mall mm -hmm. have a lot of people in black because they are going to cause trouble and I don't want to be caught in trouble. When I walk on the street, in, if I come across them, I will keep my mouth shut because just in case I say something that is disagreeable with them, they will hit me, harm me. Our freedom, our right. human right, our freedom of expression, my right to go to any place in Hong Kong that I feel I want to go, these are all compromised because of their so-called pro-democracy and freedom movement. But it is not. I, I, I have to tell you, it is not a pro-democracy or seeking freedom. Their freedom is the freedom for them only. Everybody else right. has to give way to what they want to do. What exactly is the legal process for this decision to become a legislation? What are some of the you know, processes that the public needs to understand? And what is the time frame? Who are the most important players in, uh, in a way, in pushing forward uh, the whole process and eventually implementing, as you already suggested, uh, uh, this piece of legislation? The standing committee will consult the Hong Kong government and the Hong Kong Basic Law Committee. The Hong Kong Basic Law Committee consists of half of the members from Hong Kong. 
So both the government and the basic law commission are venues for views, different kinds of views, to be uh, conveyed to the standing committee in the process of making the law. And after the law has been um, made and um, introduced into NF3 and promulgated in Hong Kong, I personally think that um, I believe that the, um, mm -hmm. the organization which have to um, carry out the law and also to pass judgment will be the local police, that is the law enforcement agencies and mm. the courts of Hong Kong. In the past, under the rule of the British, we actually have a fairly large group of people working under the political uh, section. There's about two to 3,000 people. And what they do is they collect all kinds of information, intelligence to protect the security of the, uh, the, the, the government and the people. So this body was disbanded about three years before the return of Hong Kong Mm -hmm. to China. And ever since then, there has been no such organization. So the Hong Kong government is actually not in a position to know what is happening in the territory because they don't have this intelligence. Their intelligence is more on criminal act rather than infiltration, mm -hmm. succession, subversion, terrorist, and all these things. Um, we needed that kind of information. Uh, Mrs. Ran, one of the things people are very eager to know is whether this piece of legislation, after the whole process, will diminish the hope of one country system or actually abide by the principles of one country, two systems. Well, what is one country, two systems? The two system is the capitalist system in Hong Kong vis-a-vis -vis the socialist system in mm -hmm. mainland China there is not going to be any change in this. The other important part is Hong Kong has been given, delegated the power of making our own laws by the Legislative Council, governing Hong Kong on all internal affairs by the Hong Kong SAR government, and judicial independence with the right of court of a final appeal. These are not in any ways compromised by the national security law. National security is for the whole country. Every inch of land of China must be covered by the same national security. Hong Kong's high degree of autonomy and our, and our ability to govern ourselves in most of the areas will remain as it is, as it is delegated to us through the basic law. People, some people are worried, oh, after this national security law, our human right will be compromised. Well, let me tell you, that is not true. Because in the decision, of the National People's Congress, the first item is to ensure that the right and privileges of Hong Kong people will continue. And then in the basic law, we have articles which ensures that the freedom of expression, freedom of uh, traveling, movement, freedom of speech, all these are protected. After this decision, after even the SAR government adopted this law and say, let's go ahead with it, uh, how will Hong Kong repair its wound as a result of political division, as a result of what happened over the past year, as a result of what is still going on right now in the streets, as a result of a very divided society? Uh, Mrs. Fan, how is Hong Kong going to do that? First of all, I think we like to go back to our normal life where we can work 
and play as we used to. Secondly, the economy of Hong Kong has already suffered a very, very big blow. So for Hong Kong's economy to recover, it will take some time and we will have to work on it. We are determined to live the way, the way life we want to live. We want one country, two system. And that system as prescribed by the basic law will continue on to work in Hong Kong. We will make sure because it is our daily life. It is our livelihood. You know, for people who are not in Hong Kong and who are making all kinds of comments about Hong Kong, they don't have to pay any price if Hong Kong goes down the drain. But for a person living in Hong Kong, we are paying all the price for all their so-called ideology or so-called dominance of the world or so-called democracy which destroys democracy itself. I hope that they will understand. But if they don't, we will still go on because we are determined to make our home a livable place. Details about the national security law will gradually roll out in the coming months, but the political division in Hong Kong could definitely complicate matters. How can its legislative council and government proceed in retrospect? What went wrong in 2003 when an Article 23 legislation was stopped but failed to be passed? Rita Fan has the answers. How can we expect the Legislative Council to be able to proceed? And how can we expect the Legislative Council and the Hong Kong uh, government to be able to proceed from there? Uh, Ms. Fan. After the government had proclaimed mm. the law, then mm. if people contravene the law, then our law enforcement agencies will comprehend that person and the um, our Secretary for Justice will decide whether there's sufficient evidence to uh, prosecute. And if they do, then the case will go to the Court of Hong Kong. And the Court of I Hong see. Kong will look at this law, which is part of Hong Kong's law, mm. and decide uh, whether uh, a crime has been committed and what sentence should be passed. The normal citizen of Hong Kong have nothing to worry about. So therefore, mm -hmm. the most of us, I would say 99% of the Hong Kong people, really, right. th this law is only protecting us. It's not going to hurt us in any ways, but it will hurt those people who are infringing on our freedom, on the mm -hmm. very core of democracy in Hong Kong, and on our human right. You were in the Legislative Council yourself. Um, what was the situation like in 2003 when Article 23 was uh, uh, being worked on and also people tried to come up with some kinds of legislation just as what we are discussing now uh, uh, from the National People's Congress? What went wrong? Uh, uh, when you look at that in retrospect, how would you reflect upon those days, Mrs. Fan? Well, in those days, everything is peaceful. People who are against the uh, the implement or, or the implementation of Article 23 went on a, a peaceful protest. Protest, and they claim they have half a million people. Um, other count says it's much less, but it doesn't really matter. It is peaceful. And then, when the the government, the then government, actually made a number of amendments in view of the reaction from the community. So everything was set to go. And suddenly, one of the political parties in the pro-establishment group, the Liberal Party, uh, decided that they are going to abstain instead of supporting uh, the draft bill. So the government do not have sufficient vote. Mm. So therefore, the government withdraw the bill. And that is what happened. But everything from step one to step ten is all very peaceful, 
sometimes there's a lot of um, sort of strong language being used, but there was never any sort of bodily contact, which we are seeing today. Oh, by the way, one thing I think uh, your international um, audience should know. The rioters, the black mobsters, they say openly that they want to pull Hong Kong down the drain. They want us to die together. That's what they said openly and in black and white. Oh, how should we understand, especially for our international viewers, why from 2003 until today there has not been successful work yet on the Article 23? After all, it's already uh, 17 years. Uh, uh, why uh, over that long stretch of time, uh, so hard that we have to do something this time from the national level? It is because that the opposition have successfully uh, stigmatized the uh, Article 23. They have put all kinds of false accusation and they use scare tactics in the community. So with this kind of constant brainwashing, many of the people in Hong Kong feel that uh, you know, Article 23 is going to be very draconian. It's going to take away my freedom. It is going to cause uh, cause me um, trouble. Mm. Actually, it is not. But our government has always been trying to um, sort of um, formulate, make a uh, mutually cordial atmosphere so that we could discuss Article 23 in a logic, reasonable, and courteous way. But that's never going to happen, as we can see now. But they have been doing that for the past 17 years. And that's why Article 23 mm. never come back to the Legislative Council after that trial in 2003. Welcome back. This is World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. The proposed national security law for the Hong Kong SA is under deliberation, while fresh unrest rock Hong Kong recently. But to understand the tension afflicting a city built as Asia's world city, it's important to focus on the city's education. On that, I speak to Annie Wu, former standing committee member, of the CPPCC. She has been over the decades working to foster youth exchanges between the mainland and Hong Kong. Ms. Wu, you are passionate about the young people and their education. Now, there is a latest debate about the liberal arts education, which deals with how history is being taught. So what do you make of the nature of the latest discussion, Ms. Wu? 20 years ago, I mentioned to the first chief executive of Hong Kong, Mr. Tong, I said, we are going through from a post-colonial period into the special administrative region of the People's Republic of China. And I suggested to Mr. Tong, day one, we have to use our education bureau to train our young people to understand the transformation. And they need to understand that they are Chinese, born in Hong Kong, but they have to understand the country is China. And I, at that time, I remember I mentioned to Mr. Dong, if you don't take care of the young people of today, 20 years from now, they will say they are only Hong Kong people. They are not Chinese. Um, this is the problem that we have faced 20 years ago. And the outcome of all mm. this violence, uh, the young people have been, actually, I would use the word brainwashed by, by other uh, uh, is interested parties to say mm -hmm. they are Hong Kong people. They want to have independence. They don't want to be part of China. And um, so this young generation in Hong Kong who are now the um, high school students, university students, including the teachers, have all been uh, instigated by this kind of uh, misunderstanding. 
uh, it's not going to be easy to take care of the job, not only just to take Chinese history back out from mm -hmm. liberal studies, but it's an effort that the special administrative region of Hong Kong, mm -hmm. the central government, and the people who are in Hong Kong to try to do the utmost to be in state that Hong Kong is out of China, first of all. And Hong Kong, the Education Bureau has to really give the young people from day one to understand they are part of China, they are Chinese. Um, this is a long-term uphill battle. It's not going to be easy. The liberal arts education regarding history, there are already proposals being made as to how it should be changed, the content of the earlier uh, component of the liberal arts education. But it's not easy to change, to include what you consider as important component. So what's next? Now how can we proceed? I think this is a total effort of the chief executive for the special administrative region and together with the director of the Education Bureau, together with the general public of Hong Kong, and also the teachers in the schools. They have to have a positive and a correct attitude to teach Chinese history. Uh, the main problem now is not the contents of the history books. It's how the teachers teach the history. Uh, the modern Chinese history. And some of them have been taught in a very inaccurate method. Mm -hmm. So the students have been taught uh, in a very negative ac uh, attitude about Chinese mm -hmm. history. So it's very important if we can have one standardized textbook on modern Chinese history to educate the students, also to really educate the teachers to teach Chinese history properly. It takes a lot of effort because I think in Hong Kong, some of the teachers are pretty anti-China and also anti-Hong Kong. Some from the opposition side in Hong Kong were trying to argue putting new content about the history of Hong Kong and its relation with the motherland and its colonial past might mean that the uh, Hong Kong SAR government is trying to brainwash the young people in Hong Kong in a different way. Personally, if you they can look at how Singapore transformed from a post-colonial, uh, I would use that city-state, into the Singapore of today. So, if at that time the Singapore leaders like the late Lee Kuan Yew did not, if they did not write the correct Singapore history, I don't think the Singaporeans are so patriotic as of today. So. To borrow a, uh, a page from Singapore, Hong Kong, we need to re-identify ourselves as a special administrative of region of China. So it's really important that we should rewrite Chinese history, the modern Chinese history correctly, and also to understand, to rewrite how Hong Kong transformed from the post-colonial period into SAR. And this is the duty and responsibility of the Hong Kong government. This is not what the officers mm. can and not foreigners can interfere with what we are trying to do for our mm. younger people. Of tom uh, doing, they are the citizens of tomorrow. Miss Annie Wu, in her conversation with me, emphasizes the importance of training teachers first and telling citizens undistorted and factual information by the media. Let's listen in. You've been working and supporting with your time, effort, money, energy for the education and exchanges uh, for the young people in Hong Kong and also from the motherland. Now, tell me more about in order to do that and further improve uh, the level of exchanges, what needs to be done, Ms. Wu? since 1997, now we have gone through 23 years. Uh, looking back at the last 20 years, we have not been carrying out the um, uh, arrangement correctly. I will use the word education, educating young people. We did not do a good job. So if we start from day one today, I personally hope to see the SAR government working together with the education department in Hong Kong, try to do things step by step, and try to understand to promote this uh, system, how to train the young people and the, and the teachers first. 
understand Chinese history correctly, which is the number one step, because the teachers are really the people who, in, who influence mm -hmm. the students. On the other hand, the central government, they should really back up the chief executive and the SAR government to do things in Hong Kong, I would use the word correctly, uh, not to just try to do things sidestep. Uh, this is the two, mm -hmm. two prong approach. Also in Hong Kong, because mm. our media have been very much distorted, I use the word distortion, and we don't have correct presentation of news from time to time. And this is the handicap of Hong Kong. So it also may be another job that the chief executive and the SAR government, they should take care of the news and the broadcasting and uh, handle a lot of information correctly to be released to the public or the public will have a lot of inaccurate information. Mm. Um, personally, I'd like to see that more people in the society mm. should really understand that we should provide accurate information to the young people and they should try to stand up to, to work in their own schools because we have 400 high schools in Hong Kong and I think we have about 600 primary schools mm. and if all these uh, uh, school principals, if they can try to do things correctly and support the government, then we can have the force from the average person. So it takes everyone to do something for Hong Kong. Uh, COVID-19, of course, uh, both uh, Hong Kong and the mainland have been handling it properly and efficiently. Now, almost uh, uh, zero new clusters. Having said that, though, it is cutting off a certain extent the interactions among localities, even within China itself. So how would you be able to promote further exchanges, which is, could not be even more crucial at this point, I mean this year, uh, of the young people uh, in Hong Kong and from the motherland, from the mainland? A lot of my friends overseas in other countries, they are very uh, astonished and they gave a lot of credits to our country, to China, for really containing the COVID-19 in Wuhan and in uh, uh, Hubei province. They were surprised and especially our um, friends from Europe is that they should learn from mm -hmm. China um, to how to handle the situation, handle, handle the pandemic. In Hong Kong, I should give credit to our SAR government. They also have been very effective in handling the situation in Hong Kong because we are not a small population. We have 7 million population and also because we are not locked down, we still have to open up the flights to look overseas. Okay. Uh, so as of, as of now, because we are still not having a direct access to mainland and also direct access to other countries, I personally feel the first priority for the SR government is to really, first of all, handle mm -hmm. the pandemic, still contain it as much as possible. Secondly, we have to look into the problem of maintaining the livelihood of the, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, flu collar workers because Hong Kong now is going through the worst period of economy. And this is a very mm -hmm. important issue for to keep people, um, I will say, at least minimum wage or something mm -hmm. that the government is doing already. For the young people for exchange, I would suggest that we should leave it later after October, when we are going to see Hong Kong situation better in terms of economy and development, uh, we can try to overstep other important issues before we try to look into the exchange of students or uh, maybe to have more cultural exchange. I would look at it after October and November. Welcome back. This is a special year for Macau delegates attending the two sessions since the city marked the 20th anniversary of returning to China. Recently, the Chinese government announced several new financial measures to support cross-border transactions in the Greater Bay Area. For Macau delegates, visitors and investment are key to a speedy recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. On that, I speak to Cui Tsai Pong, who is a deputy of Macau Legislative Assembly and also Macau delegate to the National People's Congress, to find out more. About uh, the 
realities as a result of COVID-19 and social distancing. It seems that uh, a lot of economies are trying to go back to partial normalcy at least, even though they do not know exactly what's to come. Uh, how is Macau's economy, uh, what exactly are you trying to do in order to come back to at least some kinds of normalcy? Well, I think we're trying a number of things. First of all, in the very bad days, uh, basically the government is advising everyone and all uh, enterprises to have their workers stay at home. And if they have to be a frontline workers, try to you know keep them having pay, but don't have to go to work. And if they can do at home, and they would encourage people to have a home office. And so I think in the first stage, uh, Peter Ho are pretty much concerned about what is the development of the uh, COVID-19 more than, you know, if they are keeping their jobs and how is the economy doing. But then after uh, we have things settled, uh, because up to this point, Macau only have 45 cases confirmed. And uh, right now, at the present time, as I know it, there are zero people in the hospital for that cause, and there are zero deaths. So I think Macau is pulling up very well, and the people are getting more confidence to go out. And so uh, gradually people are going back to work. And right now, government also put out policies of having a consumer uh, coupon. Uh, that is a way of encouraging you know, local citizens to uh, go to restaurants mm -hmm. and uh, supermarkets and uh, you know, buy other services. Even for creative industry, uh, you know, they are trying to sell, you know, arts and uh, things like yeah. that. And uh, the government's stimulus program is gradually putting people uh, back in control with the economy. But certainly, Macau is keeping a close eye on what's happening to our neighbors, to you know, everywhere. But then it's hard for Macau to open the borders if you know other people are getting sick. Right. So I think health as number one issue is still Macau's policy. And after health, then it comes economy. And uh, so far, I think uh, we are doing mm -hmm. okay with the internal uh, consumer market. External is definitely not nearly close to what we would hope it can be. You were at the opening ceremony of the MPC. You listened to the government work report. Obviously, the central government is not looking at at all a specific number when it comes to GDP growth rate because so much uncertainty. Now, uh, with the tourists mainly coming from the mainland, what does that mean for Macau? Does Macau have some kinds of uh, uh, alternative plan, at least for short term, how to make the economy move? As we can find out, there are a number of businesses actually are getting positive growth, such as the online education and uh, on online markets, and they are doing quite well. And I think the people are seizing this opportunity as a way of promoting their products uh, online. And I think the local citizens are taking it in quite well. And also, you know, with the online business, Macau is actually opening the door earlier than we would expect. Mm. It's not opening the door physically, but then the online market is up and running. This also stimulates the government yeah. have to look into investing heavier and faster into the uh, intercommunication. Uh, you know, the, the uh, 5Gs and other, you know, internet-related uh, mm -hmm. services would definitely have to be kicked in, in the high gear. And so this become a new trend for Macau to, to look at. And, uh, mm -hmm. of course, you know, as we look at the, the central government's policy, it says, you know, there's no definite number they would try to put. But having no number doesn't mean having no strategy. I think the government has a very clear strategy of what they want to do except that, you know, it's, it's not totally up to China to decide because, uh, you know, natural uh, epidemics and uh, pandemics is, is beyond what a country can do. But definitely, I can see the government is, is doing something. It's promoting a lot of uh, uh, internal uh, consumptions. And for Macau, as a small market, we will try to do the same because as the border is still closed, uh, mm -hmm. we don't have free access or easy access to uh, mainland and uh, even Hong Kong. Uh, stimulating the internal market is the only thing we can do, and uh, probably this is the best right. we can do for now. I'm very impressed by the resilience attitude uh, uh, coming from Macau, sir. Having said that, though, I did want to mention, I do want to mention the Greater Bay Area. 
Now that was uh, being mm -hmm. considered as a shining spot in terms of cooperation uh, between the three sides, among the three sides, the mainland, Hong Kong, Macau. Now, uh, with mm -hmm. social distancing borders, uh, I mean, among regions is still uh, relatively closed. Uh, how do you look at that, and particularly the amount of uh, investment already put in there? Well, I can see the policy is being delayed, but uh, not stopped. You know, the temporary suspension is definitely the case, but then it doesn't mean you know, will forego mm -hmm. this policy, and so it would just probably would put uh, us back in time, maybe half a year or even a year. The ultimate goal is to unite uh, the uh, Great Bay Area, and I think this policy is definitely is going to be the way to go in in the coming decades. Mm -hmm. it's, it will take time, and uh, with Macau cooperating with the uh, Zhuhai, especially in Hengqin Island. This is going to be, you know, taking some time for us to, to develop because, you know, hundreds of years for Macau to develop and if we can really fully make use of the uh, Hengqin Island, I won't say, you know, take three centuries, but at least, you know, take 20, 30 years and probably that will keep Macau mm -hmm. busy for a while. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely that will keep Macau mm -hmm. busy for quite a while. Having said that, though, yeah. um, talking about Macau's neighbor, Hong Kong, at this year's uh, mm -hmm. National People's Congress, one of the most important tasks for the country's legislature is to work on a decision uh, about establishing and improving the legal framework as well as the implementation mechanism of uh, Hong Kong SAR for national security. Now, it has a lot to do with the earlier unrest in Hong Kong and chaos and political divisions. Uh, but, you know, watching your neighbor, uh, Mr. Choi, uh, how do you look at the latest de decision? Well, people are taking it very seriously because, you know, Hong Kong situation is definitely uh, worthy of much greater attention and people should really divert our attention to fighting the virus and, and take some time to look at, you know, how Hong Kong has been. And it has been over a year plus uh, in, in all the situation. And I think uh, the central government is putting this through the NPC with this decision. I think it's very timely and prudent and a proper uh, and responsible. Well, looking at the experience of uh, Macau SAR, the Special Administrative Region, probably you can provide some reference to all of us as to how it works, you know, the relations between the central government and the SARs, and how people living and working there, what is it like for them? Well, actually, I think the Macau people understand the one country, two system in a very, uh, clear manner and we understand that you know under one country is the most important things without china macau would not exist the macau sar would not be formed in 1999 and so i think people know the sar is part of china and not vice versa and not you know an uh, independent country or place so this definitely with this understanding people uh, live with this motherland in good harmony we understand that uh, the betterment of Macau can benefit China, can China's betterment would, you know, the main would also help Macau. And so this, you know, relationship is very clearly demonstrated when Macau put forth the 23rd Articles uh, to create our own uh, security uh, legislation. It went through very smoothly. People understand what needs to be done and people put, quickly in, put it in place quickly. Because with this guarantee, Macau can function in a long time uh, in, in a safe manner. And with people not worrying, you know, their national security, uh, Macau can now concentrate our effort in creating our own economy system in the way that would best serve Macau as well as serve China. And to be a window, you know, for China to go to the rest of the world, especially to the Portuguese speaking country, uh, definitely is, is the, uh, you know, consensus for Macau people. And I think the central government also agreed with that very much. Now look at it, uh, the UNESCO has classified Macau's uh, historic city as a heritage place in 2005. Now that is an international attention that has been given to Macau, which we never received before. And uh, in 2017, uh, UNESCO again classified Macau as a creative, industry, a creative city. Uh, and so that is also another compliment for Macau. And so we can see, you know, as Macau is growing steadily and healthily and strongly and internationally, 
we are receiving proper attention and people are giving the deals to Macau and I think the Macau people are enjoying the fruit of our labor and also the fruit of the economy. And so I think Hong Kong can also look at and uh, see if they would want to have something similar yeah. to Macau. The world is becoming more complicated. Uh, it's not just a pandemic, there's also geopolitics, uh, there's also a, a very different world order likely to uh, evolve uh, in, right in front of us. It, that's something we haven't seen for quite a few decades. So, uh, Mr. Tsui, how do you, looking at the latest situation, what is your take, sir? Well, I think China is going to have to go through a lot of tough times. But then I think I'm confident that Macau and China would come out ahead much stronger than before. And this trialing period may be long, and uh, measures have been taken, may be sometimes painful. Uh, but I think, you know, it's like any growing process, you know. At the end, I think you know, the world economy will come to their senses, will be back to order. People will come to the senses and back to order. And hopefully, the virus would be able to be subdued by, by our technology. Mm -hmm. If not, we have to find ways to coexisting with it uh, as any other virus that we face. And I think, you know, China would become a stronger place. And that is all the time we have for today. And with that, we're wrapping up our reporting of the annual political season in China. If you want to know more, certainly try to find us, World Inside, in your search engine or check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook accounts. On behalf of my team in Beijing, thanks for watching. Bye for now.